really warm welcome to this Green Alliance event. I'm Ruth Chambers from Green Alliance and I'm going to be chairing um, this afternoon's event. And I'm joined by three expert speakers to dis discuss how we can inspire long-term policy thinking on the environment. I'm delighted to welcome Sophie Howe, the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, who is the world's first and only at present Future Generations Commissioner. Caroline Lucas MP, sponsor of the Wellbeing of Future Generations number no. two bill, which has just won an important ballot in the House of Lords, and we hope to see that making progress shortly. And Dave Zagaji, climate justice activist, political candidate and student. So before I hand over to our speakers, I wanted to give a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, usual Zoom rules apply. If you'd like to pose a question to our speakers during the event, then please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We're going to be monitoring questions and they're going to be read out and put to panellists later by Holly Rowden of Green Alliance. You've also got the option to upvote questions from other attendees, which will make them more likely to be asked. The chat function is operational and please do use that if you want to chat with other attendees, but do note we're not going to be monitoring this for questions. If you'd like to tweet during the event, then the hashtag is hashtag Green Alliance at GA event. And now without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sophie, who's going to start us off with some opening words. Over to you, Sophie. Thanks, it's great to be with you um, today. So as you heard, my um, job is rather unique. Um, I'm in a, um, a place where I would um, greatly value having uh, more friends, um, being the only future generations commissioner in the world. But as I was um, saying uh, earlier on, um, perhaps Caroline is the sponsor, or one of the sponsors for the well-being of future generations bill in the UK Parliament can um, can help me out there. Why is it that um, you know thinking long term and legislating to protect the interests of future generations is so important? Um, well, you've only got to look at the climate crisis, the nature emergency that we are um, in the middle of, um, to understand why short short termism is um, so prevalent and so endemic in policy making um, and why there is such a need to, to try and shift that to the long term. Our political systems um, are broke um, in my view. The fact that um, you know a government's set of priorities are set out within a five-year window simply doesn't speak to some of the big challenges that we're facing in terms of climate change but also um, in terms of automation, artificial intelligence, the aging population, changing demographics and so on. And so our Wellbeing of Future Generations Act um, in Wales really is internationally groundbreaking in that it, it uh, puts these statutory duties on um, the 44 of our main public institutions in Wales, so all of our local authorities, our health boards, um, our, our national organisations like Public Health Wales, and then significantly the Welsh Government itself, to demonstrate how they are acting in a way which meets today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, it does a number of other things which um, are interesting too. So obviously the legislation is about sustainable development, but it brings together the those concepts of sustainable development and well-being economics, which actually are very much aligned, but you don't often um, hear them being brought together. So we see New Zealand perhaps being the kind of poster child of well-being um, economics, but they very rarely talk about um, you know, the UN SDGs and how those um, linkages um, are, are there. So um, that those two concepts coming together are a really important feature of our legislation. The other aspect is that it sets out seven national wellbeing goals, um, goals which are long term goals about the Wales we want to leave behind to our children and our, and our grandchildren and future generations to come. And they were devised in conversation, a national conversation with the citizens of Wales, um, the Wales we want, um, devised through those conversations and then look into the UN SDGs to form these sort of long term goals for Wales. So they work beyond political cycles. Um, they set out in law each political party and if you follow Welsh politics at all you'll be aware that we had an election 
um, a week or so ago and um, each political party will now have to form their manifesto commitments around um, setting objectives to meet those seven national well-being goals. Another interesting aspect um, of it is the fact that um, you know the, the goals, the titles of the goals are nothing that um, perhaps would surprise you, so we want healthier Wales, a more prosperous Wales, a more equal Wales, um, a, um, a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language, a resilient Wales, um, that's about ecological resilience. But if you look at um, the statutory definitions of um, some of our goals, so the goal of prosperity in particular, it talks about a productive, innovative, low carbon society, um, which uses resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on, on climate change and focuses on a well-educated population um, with the skills which will enable them to access decent work. Um, so, you know, a long definition there, but pick out, you know, some of those key phrases in terms of the different approach that we're taking in Wales, in terms of our economy, prosperous, you know, innovative, productive, low carbon, using resources efficiently and proportionately, acting on climate change, focusing on decent jobs, not just any old jobs. And so that framework really around the economy is, is um, helping Wales to do different things. So if you look at our approach, for example, towards um, zero waste or beyond recycling, um, the way in which um, our government is now looking at um, that circular economy, not just in a way which reduces waste, but also recognising the connections between a number of the other wellbeing goals. So our strategy actually talks about the fact that by setting up community, um, you know, repair cafes and um, just this week um, something called Bentham, which is the, the Welsh word for borrow, a Benthig van, um, electric van has been um, established in Cardiff and is going around um, with a library of, of things for people to borrow. But the connections that have been made there are not just about zero waste, but are about community cohesion, about improving mental health through bringing people together through those sorts of activities. And that's where, again, the beauty of our legislation really comes through, because in addition to those seven wellbeing being goals, we also see five ways of working. So five principles by which all of our public bodies have to act. So planning for the long term or recognising the long term consequences of the things that they do, preventing problems from getting worse or occurring from occurring or from getting worse, integrating their thinking. So find and do the things, spend your money in the areas which are going to maximise your contribution to all of those goals. Don't pick the things that are going to have massive massive economic benefit, so it might be claimed, and huge um, environmental cost. Find the things that are the multiple wins and do those things. Um, and then involving citizens and collaborating together. And then, of course, um, quite brave of the government, I guess, to set up um, the, the um, role of an independent statutory commissioner um, designed to hold them to account. So I'm not sure how well thought through um, that was and whether they might do um, the same again. But I suppose my job, well, is set out in law, is to act as the guardian of the interests of the future generations of Wales. Um, and I often um, sort of define that in simpler terms around calling out the nonsense on behalf of future generations, because a lot of policymaking that we see certainly um, that has gone on and sadly is still going on um, is, is nonsense, both for current generations and for future generations. So the fact that, you know, the wealth um, of the world is concentrated in the hands of a tiny number of people. The fact that um, across the world, economic gain massively um, outweighs, um, you know, environmental considerations in so many areas. Um, the fact that, um, you know, ill health is clearly linked to poverty, to your living conditions, whether you're living in areas of, of high air pollution. The fact that all of these things are integrated. So actually climate justice is a racial justice issue. The fact that the people who are hardest hit by climate change are those in the global south. The fact that in this country, in Wales and across the UK, if you're from a black Asian minority ethnic community, you're far more likely to be living in areas of high air pollution. You're far less likely to have access to nature and to public open space. So bringing together this kind of discourse around these concepts of well-being, I think are critically important. It's my job, as I said, to call those things out, to put forward progressive new policies and you might have seen that um, at the end of the uh, last week 
the Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford um, said that his new government will commit to a trial of a universal basic income, something that um, I have been calling for um, for um, a number of years alongside um, a number of brilliant campaigners. And I think that having that framework of the Future Generations Act um, is hugely important in terms of setting that kind of context around how we do business in Wales, how we make policy in Wales, and how that has to be done um, in the interests of future generations and get into the root cause um, of many of the problems um, that we're currently facing. Thank you, Sophie. Well, I, I mean, wow, there's so much in there um, that we definitely won't be short of content for the next hour. And how refreshing, calling out the nonsense on behalf of future generations. We should all have a subtitle like that. So, Caroline, if we can come to you next, please. And I'd like you to maybe kind of share your reflections. Um, because future generations don't vote. They lack political and financial power. They cannot easily challenge our decisions. And they don't always have eloquent and passionate people like Sophie working on their kind of collective behalf. Following on from Sophie's comments, the patron saint of Wales, St David, once said, which translates as do the small things. So we all know that small things matter. Collectively, they can make a big difference. But are they enough? What do you think? Thanks very much, uh, Ruth. And, and, and thank you to Sophie for that really inspiring um, presentation really of, of, of what's possible when you've got the right political will and and Ruth you're absolutely right that the current disenfranchisement really of future generations and young people underlines the importance of, of legislative and institutional change um, and that's to do with the climate and nature emergency but it's also to do with things like voting age our laws and institutions you know who's making the decision who's in the room who's not in the room and so on and We've seen young people asserting, you know, a massive impact just recently, for example, through the school climate strikes. Um, but in a sense, you know, people shouldn't have to be skipping school to be able to, in order to have an influence. That shouldn't be how it happens, um, or it shouldn't be how it needs to happen. And so I think this kind of legislation around future generations and indeed around ensuring that younger people get their voices heard is massively important. You were asking, um, about that, uh, that quote, which, which I hadn't heard before about, you know, are small things enough? Um, and you won't be surprised if I were to say that, I mean, small things are important, of course they are, but no, they're not enough. And we need these big changes too, um, because we are facing a climate and nature emergency that is the greatest threat that we've ever faced. And it can sometimes be very convenient for governments to suggest that the way to do this is for each individual to make small changes in our own lives. But A, that doesn't really work if at the same time the government is continuing to pursue damaging policies itself, which completely outweighs whatever contribution we're making. And B, so many of the changes that many people would love to make, like shifting more to public transport, for example, leaving a car at home, um, eating more, more local, uh, organic food or whatever, these things can often be difficult to do because there isn't a system in place that makes it easy, affordable, the common sense thing to do. So even when we're looking at, at smaller things, individual behavioral things, they need the systems change to make them more possible, to make them more affordable, to make them more, more easy. If you live in a village where your last bus is at six o'clock in the evening, it doesn't matter how committed you are to using public transport, if it doesn't exist, you know, why is it the case that train travel is so much more expensive by and large than, than, than taking a car or indeed taking uh, a, 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 a plane and so forth. So, so we need to have the right price signals um, and the right kind of systems change to enable people to, to make the difference. But I just wanted, if I could, just to flag a couple of examples of, of kind of small changes to legislation that actually would have a, a massively large influence. And it's an opportunity just to flag a piece of legislation that I'm excited about called the Better Business Act. Um, and basically this is a campaign to change section 172 of the Companies Act 2006. It's being championed by over 500 UK businesses and the B Corp movement. Um, and it simply provides that the duty of a, of a company director is to promote the purpose um, of the company in a manner that benefits the members, wider society and the environment. In other words, it's quite a small tweak to that particular article of legislation, but the impact of saying that instead of acting just on behalf of shareholders, 
you're acting on behalf of stakeholders more broadly and including uh, young people, including nature and so forth, a relatively small act like that could have a massive impact. Um, a similar example, one of, one of the pieces of legislation that I would love to see happen would be a, a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. This is the idea that we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground, but that doesn't work if one country does it, but then simply imports from another country that hasn't done it. So borrowing the idea of non-proliferation from the, from the nuclear movement, this idea of a fossil fuel non-proliferation bill, I think is a, is a really practical way in a way of trying to get fossil fuels to stay in the ground. That's a big thing to do, but some small steps towards that would be, for example, the fact that the oil and gas authority currently has a legal duty to maximize the economic recovery of oil and gas. So if you just change the word maximize to minimize, that's a very small thing to do, but it would have massive, massive implications. So I think this idea of the small changes, big changes, you can play them on different levels. And we certainly need the big, big changes, the institutional changes, the big policy changes, but actually there are some things we could do that wouldn't take up huge amounts of parliamentary time, but would have a massive impact, even just by changing a few things in a couple of clauses of a couple of bits of existing legislation. Caroline, lots to come back to there. And that change you've just highlighted, actually, you just need to change two letters of that act, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> which is really not a very big change at all. Um, Daisy, if we can come to you now, please. And if you wanted just to kick off with uh, some reflections on the work that you've been doing on environmental and climate campaigning. And in particular, if you're able to kind of share with us, what do you want to see from our leaders? Um, I feel that the work that I do really recognises that we need change on many levels, as Caroline has said. There is importance in individuals finding agency around the issues that they face, like cutting down on transport, like eating less meat, like shopping organically. Um, but also this has to be done on a community basis of where we consult within each other as a community of what can we do to aid each other, but then also on a national level of making sure we hold our governments to account and making sure that democracy works in the way it's meant to, them representing us, um, rather than the other way around and them telling us that what we need is impossible and can't happen. Um, and I think for saying what we need. We need more Sophies in the world. We need more people who are thinking about the future generations and how it's going to impact them and how our actions right now are so important for what may happen next. And I think as being a young person right now, um, there is a recognition that even within my role as a 21 year old student, I need to make sure I protect the next generation. So the next generation doesn't have to go through the grief and loss that I have gone through. The next generations can choose to vision large and wide about what they want to do with their lives, not feel like they need to do something with their life in order to protect others. So this is where we need more people like Sophie, more people that remember that we have to make decisions that are beneficial for the next generation to come, not just short term decisions. Thanks very much, Daisy. And I think we're writing a manifesto before we've even started, aren't we? I mean, more Sophies in the world, small things matter, but they can't actually happen without big changes. So if we can come back to you, Sophie, for a few minutes, um, and I just wanted to kind of reflect on something that when I was reading up about, you know, the work that you've been doing and how your role came into fruition, in 2015, the United Nations said about Wales that, you know, what Wales is doing today the world will do tomorrow and action more than words is the hope for our future generations. There's recently been a change in government and um, you've alluded to some of the positive announcements that have been made. How do you see the direction of travel? Do you feel like you're getting enough cut through in Wales and do you think that the rest of the world is listening? Um, I think that we sort of we started off quite um, quite slowly and, and I think it's worth flagging that um, as important as the legislation is because I think what um, what I've seen across Wales I mean you know when we talk then about the you know the small decisions and the big decisions and so on you know every day across um, the UK and across the world decisions at varying levels are being taken which are going to have an impact on our future generations so that's whether you know the school that the local authority is going to build is carbon um, you know is a carbon neutral school it's whether um, you know the hospital decides to build their um, you know new facility on the outskirts and not think about public transport it's all of those sorts of things so the well-being of future generations that what we're certainly seeing is that it's given 
giving that kind of platform or that framework for decision making making for all of our institutions in Wales and I certainly can't claim that it's perfect every day certainly there are decisions that are taken that are not in line with the Future Generations Act and that frustrates me greatly but what it has done um, it gives like I talk often about this sort of group of what I describe as frustrated champions out there in the public sector and probably the private sector and, and third sector as well who for a long time have been able to see that there's a better way of doing things so the, these are the people who are you know um, you know, repairing things or, 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 you know, rebuilding things which could have been repaired and seeing the sort of cost of that. They're the social workers who were seeing generation upon generation of the same family um, coming into the care system. They're the GP who were saying, seeing similar things in terms of, of patients. And for those, um, those sort of frustrated champions, the Future Generations, that gives them that kind of framework of a better way of doing things and permission to challenge the system. So they are able to go to their directors of finance and say, you might want to spend that on not building a zero carbon school but you now have statutory duties to to not do that so that's an important principle in terms of the kind of broader policy making in in government so we've seen um, some really significant progress in the last um, two years in particular. So um, you may have um, read about my interventions in relation to plans to build um, a new M4, so to spend the whole of Wales's borrowing capacity on building a new motorway. And I intervened and challenged the government on how this was in the interests of future generations. And we won the argument there. The government had been you know, planning to proceed with spending all of that money on a 30 mile stretch of road and they, um, they change their minds and um, we're now seeing so it was a 1.4 billion and you know as we know these things always go over cost 1.4 billion pounds investment we're now spending 800 million pounds we're getting six new train stations um, mass investment in public tra transport um, in the region and, and active travel routes um, and then alongside that just before the election my team have been working really hard on a new transport strategy for Wales, which really embeds um, all of those um, approaches. So the new transport strategy for Wales puts um, reducing the need to travel at the, the top of the hierarchy, then active travel, um, then public transport, then EV and then um, and, and so on. So that's where um, that is setting the whole framework for investment uh, decisions in terms of transport in Wales. Similarly, we can see, um, you know, changes to the curriculum in Wales. Wales, um, which have a number of principles around healthy and active citizens, um, creating ethical and informed global citizens, um, a really important um, you know, principle to have within the curriculum. Um, there, and then at, at a local level, you can see how some of these things are kind of flowing through. We think about our carbon emissions, our, uh, the healthcare system, if it was a country, would be the fifth biggest emitter um, in the world. So, um, and we've previously seen, you know, where, you know, we deal with, you know, operations and, and treatment, environment is not our problem, except it is their problem because of the hundreds of thousands of people who are dying every year as a result of air pollution and the hundreds of thousands more who will die if the climate crisis is not, um, is not addressed. And so we're seeing things things like um, our Swansea Bay Health Board is working with the National Botanic Gardens to create sites for nature um, across their estate. Um, Cardiff and the Vale Health Board, instead of selling off some land that had been earmarked for development, have turned that into a community orchard with local growing schemes, um, working with um, an organisation who um, upskill people around um, green, uh, green jobs and so on. So these are, you know, you can go from the, the sort of macro big decision decisions down to how things are playing out on the ground and it's not perfect um, but it's certainly um, triggering a change in the way that we do things in Wales. Thanks Sophie. Um, Caroline, so Westminster is a slightly different place to Wales, it's obviously bigger, more complicated, you know we haven't got seven well-being goals, we haven't got five ways of working, we've got a plethora of other things instead one of the things on the government's agenda at the moment is levelling up, so trying to kind of rebalance the economy across the country. Do you see levelling up as a way to bring um, well-being and future generations more into our political discourse, or is it not the right thing at all? First of all, I mean, just huge congratulations to Sophie on everything that she's been doing. And I was sort of sitting here kind of metaphorically with my head in my hands, just thinking, why can't we have one of those? And of course, that's what this bill would do, the bill that you mentioned earlier, if uh, if Lord Bird successfully pilots it through the 
through the Lords and we get it through the, the Commons as, as well. Um, and in terms of, of levelling up, it's a, it's a funny phrase, isn't it? I don't know that many people kind of feel they want to be levelled up. Um, they, they want basic rights and they, and they want to have their voice heard. And I think that's something that is even more, um, even more urgent and, and, and more viscerally felt as we hopefully begin to emerge from the COVID crisis, because there's been so much stress on how sort of going back to normal isn't good enough because normal was failing so many people. And indeed we've seen how COVID has shone such a spotlight on the gross inequalities still in our country. And it's also shone a spotlight on, for example, just how precious green space is for our health, our mental well-being, as well as our physical well-being and so forth. So it feels as if there's this real moment of people feeling that they want something better. And of course, Boris Johnson has, has borrowed his phrase about building back better. But I've yet to see much that really convinces me that, that the, the so-called levelling up agenda is, is, is going to, to do that. Um, I mean, it certainly could in the sense that we've made the case right from the start. And certainly people who've been involved in, in policies like the Green New Deal have always been saying that, that um, greening the economy, greening society and making it fairer are two sides of the same coin, that we know the environmental crisis hits poorest people hardest, we know they're least responsible for it, we know that investment in the green economy can precisely deliver the jobs uh, in communities that might have not had jobs for, for a while, who, who might be a, a threat from, from the transition from high carbon to low carbon. So this potential synergy between addressing social justice and environmental justice feels like it's there to be grasped. I think that's the kind of frustrating sense of the, of the moment that we're in right now. It feels as if public opinion is, is well up for this. And you can see it in things like the results of the um, Citizens Assembly on Climate. You know, the kind of proposals that that representative Citizens Assembly came up with are far more radical than anything the government's doing. So, so they're ahead of government on this. I think some businesses are ahead of government on this. I, cited the fact that 500 businesses are, are behind this Better Business Act and simply want there to be some, some clarity for the future so that they can make investment decisions in the certainty that the rules aren't going to change next week or, or next month. So the business, some business at least is in the right place. I think the majority of people in the right place um, and, and all of the evidence is that investment in the green economy is the, the most effective way to stabilize the economy, to create the jobs, to begin to to, to get the recovery to happen in, in all parts of the country. Um, and, and yet it still feels if you compare, for example, the amount of finance that the UK government has put into, into a green recovery to, for example, the, the, the President Biden plan, that the levels of ambition here just don't seem commensurate with the, with the scale of the challenge or the scale of the opportunity, when I, well, as they say, when I think so many people are actually up for this, if only a bit more leadership was being shown. Days. I mean, that synergy between, um, you, you know, what, what the public wants, what the government is able to deliver, you know, the inequalities between social and environmental and racial injustice. I know it's a space that you've been very active in. Um, Sophie talked about uh, the need for us all collectively to improve our eco-literacy, if I can call it that. So for us as um, human individuals to understand where we fit into, you know, the precious planet that we reside on a little bit better. As a student, do you have any thoughts on this? Is eco-literacy something that we should be championing? Is it something that, that we just do? Well, what do you think? Yes, I think that <laughs> we should be championing, but also I think that political literacy is something as well, and they work hand in hand together. Um, a lot of the time, especially from my own story, like I didn't know that the government was actually meant to listen to us growing up. I kind of presume they do their own thing, and then we just have to deal with it, and we have to make the best out of bad things that happen. Um, and this is not right. And when we have young people starting to recognize their rights within what's happening and the agency and the fact that human, this is a human rights issue, not just an environmental issue and the interlinked um, holistic nature of the issue that we're facing, this is when we'll have more action from government because they cannot continue to go on the way that they are. So I think it's really important to make sure that people feel like they have the information um, and have the, the knowledge in order to challenge what's happening. Thank you. And you've just had a big thumbs up from the audience on uh, your point about environmental and political literacy. Um, 
Holly, if it's okay with you and, and you're ready, I think we might come to the questions now because we've had quite a few and they are really interesting. So to move the debate forwards, um, would you like to put some questions to the panel, please? Absolutely, thanks, Ruth. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted a question so far. Um, so the first, the first question, which kind of caught my eye uh, by, way of, by way of background is uh, for Sophie. Um, how did your post come about? Um, and then the second part of that question is, what was critical in making politicians take a step that could make their jobs harder? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think if if anyone's ever been um, involved in politics, um, you will know that you know sometimes you can be campaigning and you know working on something for years and years and years and it doesn't come off. And and other times there's just stars sort of align, uh, new people arrive in particular posts and and so on and things just um, kind of happen. So um, I suppose it was a bit like that in some ways. We had a particularly um, passionate um, environment minister at the time, Jane Davidson. Um, she was um, so it, within the government of Wales Act, which established the um, the, the 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 you know Welsh devolution. Um, there was um, this concept that sustainable development should be a central organising principle. In reality, what that had meant is that um, the environment minister would produce a report to the um, to the Senate once a year that would no one would take much interest in um, and actually you know it would be seen as her business when actually you know what we need to be doing here is you know even more the responsibility of the housing minister and the economy minister and the transport minister and um, and so on so she was very frustrated by this at the same time the um, the UK government had um, just um, changed from Labour to Conservative and the UK government and um, abolished the um, Sustainable Development Commission, who um, some people may recall, and um, that was seen as kind of, you know, um, you know, a really retro, uh, you know, a, a really regressive um, step um, by the Welsh government, and they wanted to ensure that, um, you know, that didn't didn't affect, um, you know, sort of Welsh positioning. So um, this particular minister managed to get a commitment in the Labour Party manifesto for that election that they would legislate for sustainable development. And she then retired um, and left the new government with this manifesto commitment, which if, you know, I, I wasn't um, you know, particularly involved in it um, at the time, but um, I don't really think they knew what they were doing. Um, and so they held this national conversation that seemed like the right thing to do. They looked to the UN because at the same time the UN SDGs were being um, developed. They drew on aspects of kind of um, more progressive policy making, which um, often happens in Wales and a really bright team of civil servants um, working with the sustainable development community, um, you know, conceived this, um, this legislation. So um, that's how it, um, that's that's how it came about. And I think that so the, the commissioner um, had been added in an advisory um, sort of with an advisory role, but without any particular teeth. And through the passage of the um, the, the bill in the Senate, um, some further powers were added. And again, back to kind of, you know, the particular dynamics of politics. Labour did not have a majority government at that time. And it was some of the opposition parties who forced through some of those amendments on, um, you know, commissioners powers. And, and so on. So this is where I say it was kind of a lot of stars aligning. But I think that, you know, we're in a different space now. The, you know, as, as Caroline outlined the, you know, the, the, the fact that young people have really built this movement um, around um, environmental, um, environmental justice and access, um, action on the climate and nature emergencies. Um, the fact that, you know, the con concepts around, you know, the interests of future generations when we go back to Brexit, um, you know, some of those big decisions that have been taken, which, you know, potentially a disadvantage in um, our future generations. The fact that um, younger generations are probably going to be hardest hit, um, you know, through job losses and so on um, in an ongoing way as a result of COVID. So this is a live issue. And I actually think that, you know, even if you don't have those particular political stars aligning, I still think that there's a lot of um, space for this debate and this movement to grow and for the pressure to come from the ground to make the government act. Great, thank you, Sophie. Um, so the next question, a couple of questions have come in specific, specifically about the well-being of future generations bill. Um, so a couple of people were asking on about the progress of the bill, um, and also a little bit more detail about what the, the bill seeks to address that is lacking from current legislation. 
Is that for me? That's uh, yeah, that's both yeah. for Caroline uh, or Sophie or anyone who wants to answer. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just just uh, kick off. I was just reflecting on what Sophie was saying about how, in a way, she thought maybe some politicians didn't quite know what they'd what they'd bitten off in a way. And it, it feels like a well-being, you know, the future of well-being, the well-being of future generations feels like how could you be against that? You know, it, it's 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 uh, and, and yet accepting that as a, as a as a framing principle actually is incredibly radical when you think through what it what it really means. What we've been doing around this bill, so it was tabled in the last um, parliament by Lord Bird, the, the founder of the big issue in the Lords, and I, I piloted it through, um, through, through, through the Commons to the extent that it, it got its, its uh, presentation bill reading. Um, and now the, the challenge is to, to resubmit it in this new parliament. And the good news is, as, as Ruth said, that Lord Bird came out number one in the um, private members bill lobby in the Lords. Um, in the ballot in the Lords. So that means that it, it will certainly start off with some parliamentary time in, in the Lords, which is really exciting. Um, since the original bill was drafted and it took a lot of inspiration, obviously from the, from the Welsh bill, there's been lots of consultation that's been going on and a lot of discussion with other MPs actually, because we really do recognize that we need to have all parties backing this, um, otherwise it's not going to go anywhere. And I know that a lot of time has been invested talking to Conservative MPs, um, you know, seeing what bits of the bill might be difficult for them and, and to what extent they might support it. So, so there's been a huge amount happening in, in the last few months. And essentially, just to give you a very quick overview of, of what the revised bill um, now looks like, essentially it's going to start with a, with a public consultation, but particularly to inform a set of what national wellbeing goals should be. I mean, I'm passionate about replacing GDP growth with some indicators that better reflect what, what is really good for our well-being, because we all know that GDP, you know, might just measure how much money is flowing in the economy, but it doesn't tell you whether that money is being used for good things or, or damaging things. So replacing GDP is crucial, but there's always a big debate about, well, what kind of basket of indicators do you replace it with? What kind of well-being goals do you want to be the kind of the, the, the organizing principle of, of government. So clearly that's a big question and there would be some kind of, of consultation to identify what those national wellbeing goals would be. And then there would be a requirement for public bodies to act in pursuit of um, the UK's um, environmental, social, economic, cultural wellbeing by meeting um, those wellbeing goals or striving towards those goals and having measurement for progress to, to get to those goals. Um, it would establish as well this bill a futures and forecasting report, um, which would be a kind of a horizon scanning mechanism to identify where future risks are coming from. And you know, one for me that is so topical just now is obviously around pandemic risk. And it does worry me that in all of the reams of, of reports that are written and, and statements that are made about COVID, we're still focusing so little attention on the hundreds of thousands of viruses that are still out there that could easily be making the same jump that the coronavirus did from animals to humans. And yet we're continuing to do the same kinds of things in terms of, of, of encroaching into ever wilder spaces in the global south that gave rise to the pandemic in the first place. So hopefully some kind of futures and forecasting principle would, would help us to encapsulate some of that, that knowledge and, and act on it rather more quickly. A difference with the Welsh model is that rather than establishing a, a single commissioner, it would, um, in this revised version, it would establish a commission for future generations. So that would be a more representative group of people who would be acting, um, following some of the same functions as, as, as Sophie's role, but actually embedding that in a commission rather than in a single person. Um, there's, there's, there's various other bits and pieces, extending the duty of the Office of Budget Responsibility, for example, to consider well-being in their work, because so often the wellbeing agenda gets kind of sidelined or even siloed in, in, in environment. Um, and in fact, so many decisions that, that actually affect wellbeing are made in the treasury in particular uh, and in budget making and so forth. So we want to make sure that it's, that it's anchored uh, in departments across the government, but including and especially around budget responsibility and treasury. And essentially, there would also then be um, a minister in each government whose portfolio would be expanded to promote the idea of, of the future generations principle across government policy. So that's a long winded way of saying um, 
there's there's been lots of consultation. Um, the, the model is very much based on the Welsh model, but with some differences. Uh, Lord Bird now is in an excellent position to really start pursuing that in the Lords, and we're hoping to have some time in the Commons to do the same thing. Thanks, Caroline. We wish that bend, uh, that bill, obviously a very fair wind. It's you know it's definitely something that's of its time, isn't it? Um, Holly, can we come to you for the next question, please? Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Days. Um, as a young person, what would you like Sophie or someone in her role in England to do next? Um, and what should their number one priority be? I think their number one priority should be stopping the harm. Um, that would be just stop <laughs> and let's figure out how we can change the what the future could be for us. Um, you know, the IPCC report was the big shaker for me, at least, in recognising that we need to act fast and we need to start putting things in place now because by the time that they actually are enacted, we need to make sure we have enough time before 2030 for it to have a meaningful change. Um, so that would be my ask. It would be to get Parliament and MPs to really find ways to stop the harm. And I think um, keeping these kind of bills in mind is a really amazing way to do it. Um, I know personally um, from working with Indigenous tribes, this is something that has been happening for hundreds of hundreds of years, um, this kind of decision making of prioritising young people and well-being. So it is something that's been trialled and tested over and over again and has been successful with Indigenous people living in areas with the greatest biodiversity on earth. Um, so I, I think that there is, I put a lot of hope into things like this, really bringing the change that we need. Great, thank you. Um, another question, which is for all panelists, is um, is current economic thinking a barrier to moving to a society that puts well-being and future generations first? Should, should we start with you again, Dave? So I, I hesitate to start with Caroline um, because I know that's one of her specialist subjects, and she feels very passionate passionate about it. Um, but if we start with you first, Dave, then maybe Caroline and then Sophie, if you want to go in that order. Yeah, I think it definitely is. Like, weirdly enough, I'm actually writing an essay on this um, and looking at different models of economics that we can start looking into, like donut economics, like degrowth models. And I think what we need to do, especially in this time of visioning what the future could look like, we need to have a really open idea of where we can go um, and kind of explore all options so we find the one that fits the communities that we're trying to serve. Um, so I do think that we need to start looking away from just this like endless growth with so much destruction in its path and start looking towards what are the things that we need within society and how can we make these things the pillars of every action that we do and make every action from a place of love, from a place of care and from a place of duty as well. To you, Caroline. Well, that was that was really beautifully put, Days. Um, that, that is it in a nutshell, really. Um, but it gives me an opportunity just to flag a petition, um, if that's okay, that was started by a young Brighton resident um, calling for a, a well-being economy. Um, basically, we need to get 100,000 signatures by uh, September to try to trigger a debate about having different measures of success of our economy rather than GDP growth, because um, and it's on the parliamentary website. If anybody wanted to have a quick look on the parliamentary website and sign that, that would be amazing. I think we're on about 16,000 signatures so far. But, but why it's so important, I think, is that, you know, for as long as we have a, an economic system that is based on the same destructive model of ever more production and, and consumption and, and, and growth, then all of the extra bits that we're doing in terms of trying to make uh, our use of resources more efficient and so forth will, will constantly be undermined and outweighed by the ongoing pressure of extracting more resources um, and producing more waste, essentially. And although there are many people who will talk about the potential for decoupling, decoupling um, the, the production and consumption from the environmental harm, there's no real evidence anywhere in the world of decoupling happening on a complete and comprehensive and fast enough way to mean that the efficiency gains that you're making are not actually being outweighed by still that overall pressure on growth. And there's so much interesting work being done just now about imagining what economies could look like if they really were circular economies or economies based on well-being rather than growth. Um, and if I could just highlight a, 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 the latest book by, by Tim Jackson um, at the, at the uh, University of Surrey um, called Post-Growth Economics, fantastic. Um, Jason Hickel has just done one as, as, as well, which I've just got here, called uh, Less is More. Um, 
And uh, essentially, if we move to, to, to an economy that where we decided what, what, what we wanted it to, to do was to address inequality or, or, or restore nature, and then worked back from those objectives, I think we'd have a better chance of, 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 of having an economy that served everybody rather than assuming that just because the rich are getting richer, somehow the rest of us are going to benefit because we've known for decades, if not centuries now, that that simply isn't working. So um, I, I, to answer the question, the current models of growth are a major barrier to um, the kind of well-being economy that we want to see, um, but there is more and more energy and work going on out there about how we could create a different kind of economy that genuinely serves people first, people and planet before, before profit and growth. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Sophie, over to you. Do, do you think we're moving to a well-being economy in Wales? Um, well, certainly we're moving in the right direction and Wales has just been uh, become part of the sort of alliance of, of um, governments for um, well-being economy. So um, that is another kind of um, promising step, um, you know, but it is hugely challenging to system I suppose what you know what we're trying to do here is both take on the kind of symptoms of a failed system and take on the system itself um, and that is a you know a, an absolutely huge shift but I think if we kind of go back to you know values that I think most people hold sadly they might not be the same values as governments hold but the people who elect these governments I think you know hold values of fairness and of equity and of you know wanting to um, you know to to, to to be good ancestors as um, Roman Gnarik um, puts it and but really what we've ended up with is quite a kind of corrosive um, value system um, through this obsession around you know the end game being economic growth um, and I think that you know when we've got a situation where what is it sort of you know the 62 richest people in the world hold, hold the same um, amount of money as the 3.6 billion poorest you know that is just so at odds with I think you know practically you know the 99.9 percent .9 of the world's uh, of the value of the you know values of people um, of the world um, and I think that you know where we you know where we talk about ah, but we need economic growth in order to you know create more jobs in order to um, you know enable people to live healthy and fulfilled lives and so on and so on um, that is just not happening so we've always worked on this model of kind of grow first and, and then redistribute later and that just doesn't happen based on that you know single fact um, alone around where the wealth is concentrated that just absolutely um, is not the case so you know very firmly in my view the answer to the the question is you know is it a problem yes it's a huge problem um are there ways that we can tackle it yes i would say it's often the the small countries who lead the way and can show um, progressive approaches to to doing that um interestingly you may not be aware but um you know, I'm not sort of, uh, I'm completely politically neutral, but the SNP in their manifesto has a commitment to a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So we can expect to see Scotland go next, unless Caroline and John can, uh, can <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, beat them or get them to the post in, um, in the UK. So again, another small and progressive um, nation. So, um, and just a few weeks ago, I was um, with the United Nations Secretary General's um, office who are discussing that sort of infrastructure at a UN level. So it's growing and there's some real opportunities there. Just to give a shout out, maybe New Zealand as well, with New Zealand, you know, with their wellbeing budget, they've actually started to do that and operationalise it in terms of their budgets now, which is really exciting. Fantastic. Um, Holly, I think we've got time for two more questions. Let's try and squeeze two more in. Great. Um, a few questions which I'll kind of combine have come in about natural capital uh, and whether natural capital and the monetization of ecosystem services is a long term solution or whether it just kind of perpetuates some of these um, modes of economic thinking that we discussed earlier that may not actually be, be helpful for the environment. Um, so that's for Caroline, but also others, others can answer. So I think there are real limitations to the natural capital accounting model, um, not least the fact that there are all kinds of things that don't have a, a monetary value. Um, and as soon as you do try to put a figure on it, there's always the risk that you then trade it off with something with something else. It means that you it becomes part of the of the commercial transaction um, rather than saying, for example, that this particular ancient woodland should not be cut down 
end of that is a, a, a values based judgment, you could say, or, 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 or it, 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 it's based on the intrinsic value of that woodland that is more than um, the cumulative sum of its of its parts, if you were to think about it in terms of carbon sequestration or use of timber or, or, or whatever else, you, you could cal you can imagine a way that you could try to calculate all of that. And yet it would still come nowhere close to being able to to capture the joy that one feels walking through an ancient woodland, knowing that it's been there for hundreds of years and that it is a, a, a an immensely special place. So I understand where the thinking is coming from when it comes to natural capital. People recognize that, you know, when, when things have got a price tag, they're more likely to be, one argument might say, they're more likely to be protected. But I do think there are real dangers in that approach as well. I noticed in the chat, someone was mentioning the Dasgupta report. And of course that went to the heart of some of these discussions. The Dasgupta report, interestingly, was commissioned by the treasury, not by um, DEFRA, not by the environment um, department. Um, and, and Dasgupta, I thought, Actually, when you read it carefully, it, it does tread quite a fine line. Some people have just said, well, it's, it's, it talks just about, about natural capital accounting. And, and I don't think it does. There are points in that where Professor Dasgupta does say absolutely categorically that, um, that, 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 that there are limits to that approach to, to environmental protection and restoration. And interestingly, he too um, is very critical of GDP growth as a, as a way of measuring the well-being of, of, of society and, 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 and indeed of, of, of um, nature. So um, in, in small ways, it, there can be some, some usefulness to natural capital accounting, but it's, it's, it's at best only, only, a, only a partial answer to a much bigger question, and there are very real dangers with it too. Grace, I can see you nodding. Would you like to add something at this point? Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I totally agree with Caroline. I feel that we just kind of have to accept that us being here is relying on nature and what nature gives to us. This should be a beneficial relationship of where we love earth and earth loves us back by providing us with air and food and, you know, natural woodlands. Like <laughs> we shouldn't have to find ways to monetize it for people to care and for people to feel the need to protect. I think, especially in this country, there is such a detachment between us and nature. And we even see it as us and nature rather than seeing it as us within nature. And once we start getting this, um, like a more true and honest relationship with the natural world, the idea of even calling natural resources natural resources would sound crazy. Um, <laughs> so I do think the roots um, in understanding this crisis is by connecting back to the land. Thank you, and that's really well put. And, and Sophie, I, I wouldn't mind bringing you in at this point, because of course that, that is how Wales does it in, um, in its environment bill, so a different piece of legislation, but rather than a natural capital approach, it is kind of based on the concept of sustainable use of natural resources. Do you, do you think that's a better or different approach? Does it encapsulate the challenge that Days just laid down then? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the approach in the um, in the Environment Act in, in Wales is again quite a progressive approach. The Environment Act and the Future Generations Act um, and the Planning Act um, all went through at similar um, sort of sort of time so um, they drew a lot from from each other but I think that the the kind of interesting um, thing about the Future Generations Act is you know there's, there's often going to be conflicts and trade-offs aren't there you know you know how, how do you decide on you know and these, this is often the argument or the, but this has got real economic gains but you know and, the, and those outweigh the environmental um, you know considerations and so on so the the duty in Wales is to improve um, the social, economic, environmental, and cultural well-being uh, of Wales, and that's not improve one more, you know, one more than another. That you know, or one, it's okay if you just improve one and not the other. That's improve all mm. four pillars of um, of well-being, um, and then you know, the 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 um, related duties then are to maximise your contribution, set objectives which maximise your contribution to all of the well-being goals, and then take all reasonable steps to meet those objectives. And where those objectives may come into conflict, like how do we you you know should we be using some of our natural resources and so on the things that they have to choose to do are the things that make the biggest contribution to those well-being goals so how is that playing out in wales where there's some really interesting approaches and um, something called project skyline which is working um, in the south wales valleys reconnecting the people of the valleys um, to their natural resources or to their natural environment so they're doing things like learning um, skills in terms of um, 
land management and so on. They are connecting people into the natural environment there and there through social prescribing um, programs. Um, they are, you know, using it to tackle loneliness and isolation and so on. They're using it to teach people um, about environment and the, and the land. And the reason why they're taking that approach is because that meets multiple of our national wellbeing goals. So I think by having that kind of framework, which is a holistic framework, yes, sometimes it be, can be complex to manage. And sometimes for the poor you know, person in a local authority who's trying to apply this, it can be quite mind blowing. But really, you know, everything is connected to everything. So we have to have that framework, which forces us to think about how do we find the things to do, which are gonna make the biggest contribution across all elements of wellbeing, and how do we avoid doing the things which are going to have a detrimental effect on um, one over another. Thank you, Sophie. And um, we've actually run out of time for questions because I think it's been such a brilliantly interesting and full debate. Um, so what I'm going to do now is come to each of the panellists one at a time and ask you to just sum up or offer any final reflections for one minute, if that's OK. Um, Caroline, let's start with you. Then we'll come to Dave's and then we'll finish with Sophie. Well, I guess I, I will go back to what I think is the elephant in the room, which is our economic system, because, you know, we've just had quite a lot of um, uh, announcements from, from, from government just today and yesterday about a tree strategy and a peat strategy and, and, and new targets for, for, for nature. And, and all of those are, are good, but targets are only ever as effective as the policies put in place to meet them. And, and when we're looking at the policies put in place to meet targets, we also need to look at the policies that are going in the opposite direction and undermining them. And I guess my plea would just be if we could only have some more joined up governments. So for example, you wouldn't have a government that on the one hand is announcing new nature targets and tree planting targets, but literally on the same, more or less at the same time is promoting a 27 billion pound road building program uh, because that's good for growth or that is going ahead with, with trashing, you know, big swathes of, of nature in order to put HS2 through. There's just no joined up thinking. Um, and of course, HS2 was justified on the, on the grounds of, of the extra growth that it would cause. So if we could go back to the, to the heart of this and get back to thinking about the economy as a servant of people rather than being the, the master of us all, then maybe we might just get more joined up thinking and a better outcome for people and planet. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Dave, final remarks from you, please. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that a lot of the time you forget the holistic nature and how all of the um, problems in the world are basically linked together. And I think climate change is really only a side effect of the toxic system that we're trying to change. Um, and I feel like when we acknowledge this, this is how we're going to really get that regenerative, not just sustainative, um, sustainability. Um, we'll get a way of which people can learn how to live and learn how to love what life is um, and learn how to appreciate the natural world and the the joy that it brings um, and I hope that you know not all of us are politicians like Caroline and uh, Sophie um, but finding ways to act in, in our agency and also hold our governments to accountable is really important for the average person. Thanks Dave and I absolutely couldn't agree more. Um, Sophie final comments from you please. Okay, well, I'm I'm going to end with a kind of with an analogy that um, uh, my um, my mentor, who is um, one of our Future Leaders Academy participants, so I, I run a, um, a program called Future Leaders Academy, and part of that um, program is young um, leaders mentoring current leaders. Um, so we've paired them with um, chief execs from um, the you know the well the twenty or so public bodies across Wales. So my mentor is um, Josh. He's the um, the youngest councillor in in Pembrokeshire, and he talks about he. He was talking about this in the context of his challenges in getting a climate change strategy in Pembrokeshire. And he said, sometimes it completely feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall. But what I've realized is that if I try and knock down the whole wall at once, that's you know almost impossible. But if I just um, take it brick by brick um, before long, big parts of the wall start to crumble and I can break through. And to take that a bit further that, you know, if the more of us who've got hammers trying to um, chip out um, a brick in this wall, the quicker 
um, this wall is going to fall and the quicker we can move um, to a better way of doing things for both people and planet. So I think the time for that um, is now. I suppose I'm just going to end by saying then, you know, pick up your hammer um, because, you know, if not now, when, and if not you, then who? Thank you, Sophie. I think that's a brilliant way to end. Um, thank you to you, Sophie. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Caroline, for being such brilliant and energising um, participants and panellists. We've really enjoyed talking to you this afternoon. Thank you to my colleague Holly for being such a brilliant question handler and thank you to Ollie hiding behind the scenes for organising today. We're really grateful for your time and tune in tomorrow because this event will be on the Green Alliance YouTube channel. Thanks to everybody for listening. Have a good rest of the day.